through 36, and, and right down near the end there, it's going to ask three questions and uh, contemplate those questions. Romans chapter 11, verse 30 says, For as ye in time past, now that's ye Gentiles, Paul writing to the Gentiles, For ye in time past have not believed God, yet now obtain mercy through their unbelief. That's Israel's unbelief. They rejected their Messiah. So in time past, we didn't believe God, and, and uh, we've obtained mercy through Israel becoming unbelievers. It says in verse 31, it says, Even so have these, that's Israel, also not believed that through your mercy they may also obtain mercy. <laughs> Boy, what mercy of God. He showed mercy to us when in time past we weren't believers. He's now showing mercy to Israel along with us in, when they became unbelievers. And he's showing mercy, he's, he, he includes them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. And then it says, uh, uh, For God hath concluded them all, verse 32, and all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? There's question one. Or who hath been his counselor? There's question two. Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed to him again? That's question number three. For of him, and through him, and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we, we do thank you for our gathering here today. And most of all, we, as every day of our life, ought to set our heart and our affections and our mind upon the gift of eternal life that's been given to us through Jesus Christ. And Father, at this opportunity to think about giving uh, and knowing and starting out just thinking about what you gave to us, is there anything that we could give to you? Speak to our hearts, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. When Paul breaks out, in verse 33, oh, the depths of the riches of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Who would have ever dreamed that Gentiles reject God, that Israel reject God, that the conclusion will be, well, I'll have mercy on them all. <laughs> the conclusion, if it was you and me, we'd, we'd be damned in the world, but not God. And it's through Christ and through the cross of Christ that God is able to have mercy upon all. Today is the day of salvation. And so when, when Paul says, uh, who hath known the mind of the Lord and, and, uh, 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 in, in his judgment, in his ways past finding out. The only way to ever know the ways of God and the judgments of God, the things that God is doing, is by going to the scriptures. So verse 34, it asks the question, for who hath known the mind of the Lord? There's not a human being that knows the mind of the Lord. We were announcing in, in, in our talking about evangelism on Wednesday that just bringing up that statement, I don't know who first said it, but boy, it's quite a thought. Who would have ever thought that when God pronounces, as he does in Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, that if we sinned and there's no power, there's nothing we can do to erase our sin, as it says in Romans 5, when we were without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. If man would have recognized his hopelessness, his sinfulness, his inability to save himself, who would ever turn to God and say, well, why don't you come and take my place and die for me? Pay my penalty for sin. No, uh, that wouldn't even enter into the mind of someone. But who has known the mind of the Lord? He did that. And then so the question is, who hath known the mind of the Lord? No one has. Or who hath been his counselor? Who gives him advice? <laughs> how to handle things, how to deal with things. No one can counsel God. The third question is the one we want to deal with. Or who hath first given to him, and it shall be recompensed to him again? Who first gives to God, and God says, Oh, thank you, I'll pay you back for that. No one first gives to God. God is always the initiator in Scripture. He is the one who is the giver. He is the one who first loved. In fact, when you find Adam and Eve sitting in the garden, it's God who pursued man and seeks man. There's none that seeketh after God. So, who first gives to God and it shall be recompensed again? Nobody. Just like the other answer to those other questions. Because everything is of Him, everything is through Him, everything is to Him are all things. 
and then to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. So, you know, that's the first verse that came to my mind as I was thinking, is there anything, what can man give to God? And, uh, and, and you know, there's, everything comes out of, you just flip back to Romans 6, chapter 6, in verse 23. Paul has dealt with, in chapters 3, 4, and 5, how men are sinners and we can't save ourselves, and we'll look at some of those verses in a moment. But then God has provided for us. And verse 23 of Romans chapter 6 says, The wages of sin is death. And he's already pronounced that we're all under sin. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. And what we've earned are wages. That's, that's what you deserve, what you, what you need to get paid for, for your work. The wages of our sin is death. And that is eternal separation from God. That's just not physical death. That's eternal separation from God. The wages of sin is death, but... The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You know, we talked in Sunday school a couple weeks ago, um, talking about, uh, I'm mind now I'm thinking what, why we were talking about it, but anyhow, we, we were quoting the fact of John 3.16, that God so loved the world. And sometimes we take what we learn in the book of Romans and go back into the book of John and put it in there, and, and John, by the time he wrote that, had an understanding of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he didn't write for that reason. He tells you that he wrote that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that you might have life through his name. His name, Jesus, means Savior. But so when John 3.16 is written, For God so loved the world, in the, in the Jewish mind, when Jesus Christ was born into the world, it said back in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, Unto us, uh, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. God gave his son, and his son was born as a child in, in Israel. But then it goes on to say, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Counselor, uh, uh, Father, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Skipped a few of them there. My point to you is that when, when it says God so loved the world that he gave his son. In the Jewish mind, when that child was born unto them, which is the son of God given to them, the government was going to rest on his soul, shoulder. He was going to be king. He's going to set up his kingdom here on earth. It's not until you get to Paul's epistles that you understand another part of that gift. It's not only did God give his son, but his son gave his life and died on the cross and paid for our sins. And as we just expressed, that God is the initiator. He's the giver. What can we give to God? God has already given us everything. In fact, in the book of Acts, it, it makes a statement. It says, uh, it, uh, Acts 17.25, it says uh, that God has given us all things, has given us life and breath and all things. God has given us life and breath and all things. What, what can we give to God? But before we talk about those things, I put, it's on the back of your bulletin there, I started looking and thinking about God being the initiator, the giver. Not only did he give a son to Israel and someday that son will be king, but as we come to Paul's epistles and talk about God giving us and his son giving himself, uh, I just entitled this, I just took some verses out of Paul's epistles, what God through Christ hath given us. And there's an emphasis if you look through that, and, and the reason it's on the back of your bulletin is I just kept cutting and pasting and putting these verses together. Uh, and I thought, well, instead of us looking up all these verses, it would take up too much time. And it's, it's, uh, I just, you know, just put it right here where we could see it. But I sat back and I just read it. And it almost reads like a paragraph. I don't know if you noticed that, if you read it yet. If you, if later on, we'll look at it now, but I'll probably make comments, so I'll break it up. But if you just sit there and read this, it reads almost like it was one chapter of the Bible just blends together in, in a perfect harmony. But my point is to point out to you is the things that God has given. In Corinthians, it says, I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. God has given us his grace. That's certainly what we're expressing over here when God concludes them all in unbelief that he might have mercy on all. That's the dispensation of his grace. God giving us his un, uh, his our undeserved, unmerited, his favor, but our, us being undeserving of it and not earning it. In, in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, it didn't actually say that God gave something, except that it says, Paul says, I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received. And what he received the message of is what Jesus Christ did for us. 
how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The passage also said that you're saved if you believe that, unless you believed in vain. Believe something other than that. Verse 5 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 says, Now he that wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, now we're talking about God here, who also hath given to, unto us the earnest of the Spirit. That God, God has given us His Holy Spirit. Not only did He save us, but He's going to make sure that we are saved, secured us by His Holy Spirit. Galatians, we were talking about this on, on uh, Wednesdays. It, it, Galatians 1, 3, and 4 says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for our sins. Not only did God give His Son, Jesus Christ gave Himself. And he gave, him, gave himself for our sins as a payment for our sins. That he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. So in Galatians 1, 3, and 4, you have Jesus Christ given himself for our. There's plural there. When you get to Galatians 2.20, it says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, uh, now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus Christ gave himself in both of those passages. Did you see the difference? The one is us, and the other is me. You're not saved until you realize that verse 20 there. That Jesus Christ didn't just die to become the Savior of the world and died for our sins. But it's, you get saved when you believe that He died for your sins. When you make it a personal understanding that He went to that cross and died for you. Then you get to Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, For by grace are you saved through faith and not of yourself. It is the gift of God. It goes back to the word saved. Salvation is the gift of God. We know that from Romans 6.23. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For by grace are you saved through faith, and not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It wouldn't be a gift if there was works involved, and, and if you did something more than believing. But that's well, that's why salvation is on the basis of, the faith, of faith, and it's not of yourself, something you do, and it's not certainly your work. Ephesians 5.2 says, Walk in love as Christ also loved us, and hath given himself for an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. You know, we say he died for our sins, we forget what that cost, what that penalty was. When he died for our sins, he gave himself as a sacrifice for sin. He sacrificed his life and he sacrificed the, the holiness that he always possessed to bear our sins in his own body on that tree. He gave himself a sacrifice unto God. In, in Ephesians 5 and 25, we might want all the wives want their husbands to read this. Husbands love your wives, but husbands are to learn what love is, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The church, the body of Christ. He gave himself so that we could be saved and become the members of the body of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17 says, Now the Lord Jesus Christ himself, and God even the Father, which hath loved us, and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace. <laughs> Boy, what a verse to memorize, huh? Especially when you get depressed someday and realize you've been given everlasting consolation. You think about what God has given you, and good hope. That hope will get you through some hard times in life, through grace. Comfort your hearts and establish you in every good work, word and work. 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, it says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Sometimes we don't know what Bible verses mean, but we certainly know what a ransom is. Someone held captive but, and held for a price, and you pay the price, that's you're paying the ransom. We're sinners, held by our sin in the clutches of Satan's hands as sinners. And the ransom against us is eternal separation from God, death. And Jesus Christ paid the ransom. He paid the price so that we would be free from the clutches of Satan and death and hell. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14, the grace, of, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, 
teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of, our, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. How much iniquity? All iniquity. He already did it. But he did it to redeem us from all iniquity and to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Peculiar. You're not saved by your works. So why do you do good works? Because you are saved. You mean you do good works for, for nothing? Yeah. Because Jesus Christ redeemed you. He made you a peculiar person. And you need to be zealous of good works to honor him. Well, we'll kind of get to that as we talk about what are those six things? If, if God is the giver, who can give God anything? Well, you know, when I started searching the scriptures, I came up with three things, only three, that the Bible actually says you can give to God. And yet I have six and the seventh, the one that we'll all give to God. But the other three are, are kind of speculative. I'm going to start with a speculative one, the very first one. And you need to think about this one. The first thing that we can give to God that, that on my list is we can give him our trust. We just read all the verses of what Jesus Christ, what God through Christ hath given us. And that is a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a complete payment for our sins. Now he's done that for everybody. We saw a verse in, in Timothy, not only is it God who, who will, his will is that all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth, but they've got to come through the one mediator, God and man, the one who gave himself a ransom for all. So it says in chapter 4 and verse 10 of 1 Timothy that, that, Jesus, that God is the, uh, Jesus Christ is the Savior of all men, especially they that believe. So the first thing that a person can give to God is their trust. I say trust because it comes out of the book of Ephesians where it, in speaking to us about being sealed with the Holy Spirit, it says, In whom ye also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. <laughs> First, God first gives you salvation, provides the salvation, and sends the preacher so you can hear about it. But after you hear the word of truth, it says, uh, it says, uh, got started again. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, after you heard the word of salvation, after ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So, that in whom ye also trusted. So, to believe is to trust. It's to put your faith in what Jesus Christ accomplished. And God has given us free will. So that's, that's a decision you make on your own. God's already provided the salvation. And the first thing any person needs to do is realize what God has given and after they hear the word of their salvation, they could put their faith in that. And that's trusting. That's just relying on God to save you and keep his word. And that Jesus Christ did indeed pay for all your sins. And, and, and so faith is the first thing that's required. But the idea of trusting is just resting in what God said in his word that Jesus Christ has accomplished for us. So we looked at several of those verses, but you're in the book of Romans, I believe. So look over in Romans chapter 3. Verses 21 and 22 speak about how God's righteousness is available to us, but it reminds us in verse 23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Then it, then it tells us being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's why the gift of God is eternal life. It's a gift. Because we can be declared righteous before... We who are sinners, in verse 23 can to be declared righteous, that's what justified means, and it's freely, it's not of yourself, it's the gift of God, and not of works. It's freely because it's, it's offered to us by God's grace, you don't deserve it, you don't earn it, but it's through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, the payment that Jesus Christ made on the cross. So that if you look at verse 28, it says, therefore we conclude that a man is justified, declared righteous, by faith, without the deeds of the law. Is, is, is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Jew or Gentile. That were justified before God on the basis of faith. 
And that putting your trust, giving God your trust, trusting in the, what Jesus Christ accomplished, is one thing that you can give. And I see, that's a speculative kind of statement there, but it is because you have free will, you have to decide to do that. Look at Romans chapter 5. Verse 6 says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man would one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God initiates. There's no one who first gives to God, but our whole thought here, okay, we can't first give to God, but can we secondarily give to God? And... And we can look at what God has done and accomplished for us. And then we can put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, who, while we were yet sinners, died for us. That God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's a matter of believing that, and upon believing that, God declares us righteous. So, certainly faith is the first part of that. Uh, you know, in that process, when you say faith, I was thinking to myself, could we say that we have to give God our sin? And you know, there's nowhere in that found in scriptures. I quoted a moment ago, Peter tells us, in his own body bear our sins upon the tree. We just read, when we were without strength, or yeah, when we were without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. He didn't just die for those who are willing to give his sins to them. He died for everybody's sins, whether they're, they're willing to give it to them or not. The only thing we can do is put our trust. The, the truth of the matter is, He took our sins. He bore our sins. The Bible says, God laid on Him the iniquity of us all. You don't get rid of your sin. Jesus Christ took care of it, whether you believe it or not. But He'll save you when you believe it. God the Father will declare you righteous when you believe it. And so the, we don't give Him our sin. He already dealt with our sin. All we can do is give Him our faith and put our faith in what He has done. Uh, when we talk about those things, it's been said long ago that the only man-made thing in heaven are the scars in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. Even in the resurrected body of Christ, God left the scars of the crucifixion on Jesus Christ's body. It says when he returns, they'll look upon me whom they have pierced. So he, he's, they're going to say, what are the wounds in your hands? And he said, those that I got from my friends. This is all the second coming of Jesus Christ. So there is something man-made in heaven. It's the scars on the body of the Lord Jesus Christ where he bore our sins and gives testimony to the fact that he paid for our sins. You know, a term that's equal, like if I, say, if I said to you, what can we give to God? I bet you some of you would think, well, I can give my heart. I can, I can give him my love. But you know, that is incorporated in that word trust. Because in the Bible, like, you don't first give to God even love. He first loved us. But we, we've been talking in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, All things work to the good to them who love God and to them who are the called according to its purpose. Corinthians, I have not seen nor ear hath heard, neither has entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. And both places where that word love is used, it's talking about those who have put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. God has demonstrated his love for us. When you trust God for your soul's salvation, there is a, you're putting that above yourself, above anything else, you're trusting him to be your savior. That, that's why I use the word trust, because it is, it is an exercise of love. Love is putting God first. And if you're trusting him to be the savior that he said, you're not trusting anything else. You realize trust is kind of a, a neat idea. In Romans 4, 4 and 5, it says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. You try to work for your salvation, God says, okay, forget it. That's not my grace. That's not salvation. Verse 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. In order for you to get saved today, you need to trust nothing else but the blood of Jesus Christ. Not, not just, Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and something else. As soon as you put the something else, you're saying you don't trust that. That's not enough. And when you trust that to be enough, that's a, that is an expression of love. 
when you believe what God has done for you. It's just the way the Bible uses it in those two, two verses. So when we talk about giving him his love, that, that's the same as giving him your faith, trusting him to be what he said he has died for you and accomplished through Christ for you to be saved. So the second thing, what we can give to God, is because God first gives us all things, and everything that is given to us is a gift from God. He giveth life and breath in all things. Even salvation is the gift of God. He first gives to us, and, and if he does all of that, and it's all by grace, undeserved, unmerited favor, there is one thing you can give to God. Come over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now here's one right out of the Bible. I think the first one is a fact as well, it's just not stated like these are stated. Verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. You know, that's the only expression. You know, faith is the means by which God's grace is received. But if you're receiving eternal life, and it's a gift from God, and it's undeserved and unmerited, once you receive it, what can be said? What can be done? What could you give God? You can give thanks. You know, when we exchange gifts, whether you exchange gifts this time of year or any other time, when you give a gift, you don't expect anyone to pay for it. You don't expect anyone to earn it. You just gave out of the desires of your heart a gift to someone for whatever reason you gave, but you gave it. There is one thing you expect from that person. That person to say thank you. Because when they say thank you, they're expressing, I appreciate the gift you've given me. I appreciate the thought. I appreciate the gift. I appreciate you valued me like this way. All of that is expressed in the word thanks. And the only thing we could give God on the basis of salvation is to thank him for it. And, uh, and, and, and when you thank him and you mean it from your heart, you are, you are acknowledging to God your appreciation for the gift of eternal life. And certainly the value of that gift, God's own son paying for your sins, keeping you out of a burning hell forever and ever. So certainly when it says in everything give thanks, it's every situation you can always be thankful to God because he's given us, remember, that everlasting consolation and good hope. <laughs> Things turn sour in this world, you got eternal hope and you got consolation even during the hard times of life. But in everything give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ concerning you. But once you give thanks, once you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us you are bought with a price. He redeemed us. So you're bought with a price, and yet there's something you can give. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Now he's talking about the testimony of the, of the uh, Macedonians as Paul's taking up a collection. We'll say something about that in a little bit. But he says in verse 5, and he's talking about how these people were poor and yet they gave a good amount of money. But that's not the giving. Verse 5, And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Paul might be talking about money, but he said, no, no. He says, they first gave themselves to the Lord. It's, it's clear in the passage, you know, when you talk about money and giving, uh, that, that the most important thing is to give yourself. If you give yourself, then everything you have belongs to the Lord. But these people, they actually valued the Lord Jesus Christ, and their oneness with him, to when it came to the things of life, before they got involved in the giving, they gave themselves unto the Lord. Now that's a decision you have to make after salvation, about, about who you are, and, and whether or not you're going to give yourself. You're bought, you're, you own, he owns you, God owns you, Jesus Christ paid for you, you're bought with a price. 
But at the same time, you can make a decision about whether you're going to give yourself to him or not. And there's something you can give to the Lord. Give your own self to the Lord. I'll let you think all that out because that is a personal decision about who you are and what you're going to be and what you're going to do with your life. In fact, these other ones, come to Romans chapter 12. The, the, the next two tie right into it, but there's a, they're a little different twist on each one of these. Romans chapter 12. It says, Romans 12 and verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world. And boy, let me tell you, this world, it, it's, it's a strange world we live in. The, just the, the things that are, are going on in all this gender identity. I went to McDonald's the other day. I didn't know who I was talking to, male or female. I had no idea. But I mean, the world has this philosophy, and it's getting... They don't acknowledge God and the reality that God says what is right, what is wrong, and what is. Now people are just inventing what is. But have no idea, no, no morality at all as far as what is right, what is wrong. I say that to you just to remind you, verse 2 there, be not conformed to this world. Don't get your morals and your values and your ideals from this world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What I want you to see in these verses, that the first thing that you can give is your service. It says, which is your reasonable service. So, we talk about give your own selves to the Lord. Okay, if I want to give myself to the Lord, what do I give Him? You can give Him your service. You can serve the Lord. You can live here on earth as a service to him. Because that would be part of the process of giving yourself to the Lord. And the way you would do that is you would find ways of serving the Lord. We already know that it's his will all men be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Telling a lost person about the gospel is about the first thing and the most basic thing that you can do for the Lord. We were quoting the verse in 2 Corinthians. It, Paul says, we beseech you. Well, he says, uh, we we be God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. So, Paul speaking for God in behalf of Jesus Christ, asking people to be saved. That's serving God. So, you, can, you give him your service, but there's something else in that same verse. Uh, and that is, when it talks about giving him, it says you can present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So in that service, you need to present your body, the one you're walking around in, for God's use in service. But before you get to the service part, you need to present yourself to God as a living sacrifice. But God doesn't use unclean vessels. He wants a vessel that has a testimony behind it. So that's holy and acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. You know, all this kind of ties into the fact that when we started out talking about giving yourselves, I said the passage there speaks about Paul taking up a collection. I want to make it clear to you right now. Do you know you can't give your money to God? That's not on my list because that's an impossibility. You can't give money to God. Anytime you read in the Bible about giving, the money is always used for the poor saints or for the poor it's always toward mankind. Even if you give for the ministry of getting the gospel out, who's getting the message? The lost people are hearing the gospel. You're supporting a missionary so that people can benefit. You can't give God money. And of course, why would God want your money? <laughs> the streets of heaven are paved with gold, <laughs> so we don't need your money. But it's funny because a lot of people think, well, I'll go to church and I'll give money and I'm going to give it to God. No, you're not. You can give it to the service of God. You can give it to the work of God. You're, but it's for the value, for the sake of mankind. But you can't give God money. But you can give your own self. And you can give your body as a living sacrifice. 
and you can give yourself to the service of God, but you can't give them money. So, you know, people get things mixed up. We read the verse last week about how the, God's goal is for Jesus Christ to be manifest in your flesh. God's goal to work in your life is so that people can see Jesus Christ in you. So, you can give God those things. Uh, the other thing that you can give to God, we've learned it in the book of Psalms. We've got time, look at both. Look at, get Psalms chapter 29. Several psalms begins this way, but Psalms 29, verse 1 says, Give unto the Lord, ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. You know what you can give God? Glory. Now it's real close to giving him thanks because giving him thanks is glorifying the Lord. But you can give glory to God in, in all things, in anything that someone compliments you about. If God has given you life and breath in all things, then you can just turn around and acknowledge God in every situation and, and bring him into every situation. Instead of you receiving glory for your goodness or for something you do, if you do it in the name of Jesus Christ, you do it for the glory of God, you're giving him glory. If someone's saying something to you, you need to give it back to God so that someone sees, oh, this is Christ manifesting you. It's not just you. You're not such a wonderful person, even though you might be doing something wonderful, but, you, but it's because of what Christ has done for you, what God has transformed your life, and you're just reflecting his life. That's giving him glory. And you do that not just in what you do, but in what you say. Uh, not accepting the praise of men is the idea that I'm talking about. But look with me, Ephesians. There's only two more verses I want you to see. Ephesians chapter uh, 1. I quoted this, and the reason we didn't go there the first time is I want you to see it here. We ought to give glory to God. We just saw that in Psalms. And we shall eternally give glory to God. I want you to see that here. It says in verse... 11, it's talking about we're going to receive an inheritance. Verse 12, why are we going to receive an inheritance? By the way, that inheritance is in heaven. But we're going to receive it, it says in verse 12, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Then we get to that verse, in whom ye also trusted. After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Uh, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. It, verse 12 says that he, we have an eternal inheritance in the heavens, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. Then after you trusted in Christ, he seals you with the Holy Spirit until he takes possession of you unto what? unto the praise of his glory. He saved you, and you are going to be to the praise of his glory. So that throughout eternity, you're going to be a trophy of God's grace. And people are going to praise God for your existence in the heavens. He saved you unto his praise, and when he takes possession of you and puts you in a glorified body, he's going to receive praise. So he sealed you until that day, so he never loses any of his praise. So, we should give glory to God. We shall give glory to God. The question is, will you give glory to God in this life, even now? Not just wait that you shall be to the praise of his glory. You have that opportunity to give him glory now. So that's certainly one of the things that you can give to God. It's called, the very chief end of man is to glorify God. I mean, if you say, what, what's the purpose? Well, ultimately, it's to bring him glory. So the very chief end of man today, your purpose of your existence is to glorify God. And you can give him that glory. So that's the sixth thing about giving that we can give to God. But there's a seventh, I said, that we all shall. Any of you figure that one out yet? Romans chapter 14.
In Romans chapter 14, Paul is writing to believers of how we should behave ourselves amongst ourselves. At the same time, he's going to quote an Old Testament passage that actually has got a larger picture. Paul's going to, the application of chapter 14 is the believer. But if you took it out of the Old Testament, the application is a broader picture than just among believers. So I'm going to make both points as I read the verse. Romans chapter 14, verse 10, it says, But why dost thou judge thy brother? Romans 14, 10. And you know, the idea of judge there is condemning one another rather than, than, than uh, actually helping one another. And now, by the, by the way, we do judge. <laughs> we judge what's right, what's wrong. If a brother isn't living right, we minister him the best way we can. Sometimes we teach him. Sometimes we have to actually disfellowship from him. But this is talking about a brother, like judging a brother as if you're on the throne and you're God. You can judge right and wrong. But, but the point here, why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set at naught thy brother? Why do you just throw him away as if he's nothing? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow unto me, and every tongue shall confess unto God, so then every one of us, oh here it is, shall give account of himself to God. Let us not therefore judge one another any more, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block on an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Now that, that statement there, every knee is going to bow, every, every tongue is going to confess to God. The point is, is every one of us shall give an account to God. Now every one of us are the believers. And we're going to stand, not at the great white throne judgment, that one, when we get raptured out, that consolation and good hope, we're sealed until he takes possession of us, we're going to go into heaven, and in the heavens is going to be the judgment seat of Christ, and we are going to give an account of ourselves. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10 the things done in the body, whether good or bad. See, we have an opportunity to present ourselves unto God as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. That's our choice to make. But we who are saved, we're going to give an account that what we do in this body after we're saved. So we can give about six things to God, but the seventh you shall. <laughs> and that is you're going to give an account of what you've done in this body. Whether you valued the life and the service that God has allowed you to have in this life for him. So we're going to give an account, every one of us, and it's not for our sins. Make that real clear. It's for our service. It's what we did in this body. Everything that you did that's for self or that's even wrong, Jesus Christ paid for that, it's taken off the shelf. But even if it's just selfishness, living for yourself, you didn't live for him, He's going to put a fire to it, and it's just going to burn away and be gone. He'll be glad it's gone. You'll be glad it's gone. But the only thing that abides the fire are the things that you've done for the Lord. And there's an eternal reward in his kingdom for those at whatever abides the fire. So we'll give an account of ourselves. but I really want to end with the other thought, and that is the general thought. When that's quoted in the Old Testament, there is a time that every knee shall bow. Philippians says that there's going to be a time that everyone is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. The beings that are in hell, whether they be angelic or human, are going to be raised and stand before them. Don't talk about the lost here. After the thousand year reign of Christ, they're going to be raised and stand before Jesus Christ at the white, great white throne judgment. It says, from whom the heavens and earth fled away. When God is angry and God's going to judge the lost, no one wants to be around. But though they're going to stand before God and they're going to be judged according to their works and giving a, given a place of eternal damnation in the lake of fire based on their works. There is greater damnation for some people, lesser damnation for other people, but all whose names are not written in the book of life, those who have never trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior, are all given a place, an assignment in the lake of fire forever and ever. So they're going to bow before Jesus Christ and acknowledge he's Lord before they're cast into that lake of fire. Every knee is going to bow. And you can understand that because God so loved the world. Jesus Christ gave himself a ransom for all. That 
What God has given us in Christ is being offered to all of mankind freely by His grace. And men think they can ignore God? Never make a decision to trust Jesus Christ as their Savior? Turn down or ignore His salvation? That won't happen forever. But we have the opportunity to receive that gift of eternal life on the basis of faith. And going back to our very first statement, put our trust in what God said Christ accomplished in our behalf. And after that, give thanks. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we do thank you for the gift of eternal life. We think today about the Son given. But Father, we know more than just the Son given someday will be King. But the Son who was given to us, to mankind, to go to the cross and give himself as a payment for our sins so that we might receive from you the gift of eternal life on the basis of grace through faith, not of ourself. It's your gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. Father, I pray that there's someone here that's just played around with their Christianity or coming to church, never really believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and the salvation that he provided for them. I pray today they will receive by faith what Jesus Christ did for them, loved them and died for them, And then, Father, may they just do the only thing they can do at that point is thank you. And, Father, we do give our thanks to you and pray that the things that we can give you we'll think about and make some decisions about, knowing that someday we'll all give account. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Pastor, for that wonderful Christmas message. Let's stand and sing our little chorus, Jesus Paid It All. Jesus Paid It All. Merry Christmas.